Hello, scholars in training. It is I, Dr. Joe Crowder, today talking to you about Tacitus and Juvenal, satirist still in ancient Rome. And I'm hoping with what we learned last week, we know what satire is all about. But just in case, from this book, The Literary Persona by Robert Elliott, a satirist will challenge an alleged societal vice. This is true. A satirist will challenge perceived follies, rampant abuses, and asserted shortcomings, usually in literary form, a mixture of wit and social criticism, but it's not always humorous. I think we figured that out last week with Petronius. But satire is nearly always, always exaggerated. And so today, I want to help you understand the exaggerations that are going on with Juvenal and Tacitus. Okay. Okay. So we have three forms of this literary um, stuff that we can use. So Petronius uses a novel, right? Just freestyle novel writing brings you the story of Trimalchio. Uh, Juvenal is a poet. And he is an amazing poet, a poet of wit, uh, and will use a certain cadence in the old Latin to bring rhyme to those who would read it. Tacitus, though, is all about the oral history, which I find extremely fascinating. So uh, when we get to Tacitus, the, the, the big question is, and the huge question that you have to ask yourself as you're reading in your Gotchberg book, Germania, is this satire? I'm going to help you with that. I am. First thing I need to show you is this weird graph. Uh, if we look down here at this timeline, uh, we see that we have uh, Petronius, uh, we have Juvenal, and we have Tacitus. So what I'm trying to show you here is that they all lived at the same time. They all breathed the same air. The thing is, events in Rome are shifting quickly uh, as more of the nobility um, and the nouveau rich are fighting for power to become not leaders of a republic, but emperors. And we're starting to see the fracturing of Rome, even though it's only the first century A.D. Okay. But I, I just wanted you to know they all breathe the same air. Just got that. Okay, so one of the things that you have to read is Juvenal's third satire. It's just in your face, man. It is straightforward. It is bam. There is nothing hidden here. We have to understand that Juvenal did the naughty naughty, he got in trouble with people who kind of oversaw what he wrote. He was a little too critical of the ancient Roman emperors, and thus he was exiled to Egypt. Once the, you know, once an emperor fell out of power and a new one came in, he was allowed to come back, but uh, he didn't have a job anymore. So he's kind of an embittered guy. Um, we'll move out to the countryside and we'll finish out the rest of his life there through his poetry and his writing. He doesn't become the person he could have become, he thought. He's embittered. He's angry. His writing is what we would consider pure satire, but I think it's a little too over the top. And he uses a character called Umbricius. Now, there is a person or an area, region, in Italy called Umbria. Um, and if we were to take you to Umbria today in Italy, it's mostly countryside, not a lot of city, urban centers in Umbria. But nonetheless, Umbricius is kind of indicative. He's a bitter guy. He's, is, is Umbricius juvenile? Some scholars say yes. Some scholars say no. 
I'll leave that up to you to decide. But we get to look at Umbricius and we get to look at how he felt about what was happening to Rome at this particular time. Okay. It begins in the Gottschberg book on 497, and I really, really, really do want you to read his introduction. It's very good, unlike some of his other introductions. This one's good. It's brief. It's to the point. Much like Juvenal. Brief, to the point. So I'm not going to go over Juvenal too much, because it's just over the top, hit your head, satire. Bam! All right, that's what it is. No, no pulling back the punches with Juvenal. Tacitus, on the other hand, he's a different character altogether. And so what I'm trying to do here is to help you out. Let's try to help you understand how Germania, which is what we're going to be reading, is indeed satire. Okay? All right. So this is me helping you. Thanks, Dr. K. You're welcome. Now, there's this guy named Kelly, uh, Donald Kelly, who um, is a historian of history. He's a historian of historiography, so which is literally the history of history. Very meta. Anyway, in this book, Versions of History is not what I want. What I wanted was the rise of prehistory. Donald R. Kelly in the book Journal of World History came out in 2003. And he's talking about, in that book, briefly talks about Tacitus. Because what Tacitus is doing is he's writing about these Germans. And he has a lot of nice things to say about these Germans. But he's writing it at a time where Romans are just getting slaughtered by these Germans. The Germans are just standing up to the most powerful armies that Rome has to offer and not doing very, very well. Historically, Rome never did defeat the German tribes to the north of the Alps, to the northeast of the Alps. Those German tribes held steadfast. There were, there were a few battles that the Romans won, but they didn't win the war. One of the things I need to point out to you is, well, according to Kelly, that Tacitus was unfazed by time. And what he means is, you know, Tacitus is writing, Tacitus is writing in that second century A.D. And it's not until the 18th century A.D. that our perception of what Tacitus wrote begins to kind of change. And much of that has to do with the new science of archaeology and, and archaeological digs, improving a lot of what Tacitus actually was saying about the Germans turned out not to be incredibly true. Um, so it's not until archaeology jumps up into the late 18th century that we find out that Tacitus may have been not telling the truth about German people. This is what I want you to understand. He's writing satires. People took Tacitus literally. And the mistake... You will make a mistake if you read Germania and you take it literally. Okay? Tacitus is a sly guy. you got to watch what's happening here. Um, Michael Lind will argue um, uh, that the founders uh, were consumed by Tacitus. It's true. Uh, that, in fact, you will read Tacitus when you read the Federalist Papers. Um, because in the Federalist Papers, republicanism is going to be defended. And what republicanism is, is making sure that the people who are in power aren't so podio, aren't of the countryside, aren't the poor, aren't, you know, people who are actually worthy to defend republicanism needs to be people who understand what republicanism is. And so the people who wrote the Federalist Papers, you know, John De Jay, Alexander Hamilton, um, those guys, Madison, they saw in Tacitus the promotion of republicanism. So this is kind of important here. Uh, Michael Lynn will write this in a 2000 article called The Second Fall 
of Rome. So what I'm trying to tell you is what Stephen Pender tries to tell you here, that in some sense, the radicalism, and it was radical, or breaking away the United States of America has declared itself independent of Great Britain, the most powerful country on the planet. That was radical. But they're doing it defending these ancient Roman terms, Tacitus inspired. So why the heck would they do that? Why would they do that? Well, maybe because Tacitus isn't Roman. Now, Gottschberg doesn't really tell us where Tacitus is from, but in this article by Mary L. Gordon way back in 1936, Dr. K, yeah, all the way back into 1936, that Tacitus' name, if we look at how names are attached in ancient Rome, it's kind of in the manner of Romans, that actually Tacitus may be of Celtic origin, in other words, even from the country of Wales. Now, I don't know whether to believe Mary L. Gordon or not, but she does present us, here in 1936 anyway, with a pretty compelling argument that Tacitus is indeed of Celtic origin and took his Roman name in the manner of other Romans. That's where Tacitus comes from. That Tacitus may have been an immigrant. That Tacitus, because of his Celtic nature, the British Isles, the uh, Ireland and Scotland, um, even part of the Gauls and the French, they were all Celts at one point, at the Romans then defeated. And that's where Tacitus comes from. And this met the founders' ideals, because here the founders, these um, came from Celtic lands, transported, transported across the Atlantic to become now American colonialists and now fighting for American ideals such as republicanism, a la Tacitus. So I want you to approach Germania with, in, in this context Look, back in, 19, in 1756, um, John Dickinson, who would go on, by the way, to be one of the signers of the American Constitution, um, had a conversation with uh, Tench Francis. Now, both Dickinson and Francis were American colonialists, and they actually bumped into each other in, of all places, London, right? Because at this time, colonial America was part of Great Britain. Dickinson and Francis are talking about what? Tacitus. And they, and they have a great conversation about Tacitus. It actually becomes an argument. Um, Dickinson leaves because he feels that he's losing the argument or he can't get his ideas through to Francis. But later on finds out that Francis said that Dickinson was one of the greatest colonial Americans ever because he had a mind like Tacitus. So there's something to all of this. Now... The thing to remember as you're reading Germania is that Tacitus is picking up what Romans think of the Germans. Tacitus never went to Germany. Tacitus never saw the Germans. He's only writing down what other people are telling him. And almost all of Tacitus's work, aside from if we took Germania and put it in a box somewhere, <clears throat> pull Germania back out later. Almost all of his works reveal that Romans are inconsistent at best when it comes to leading the country or leading the empire. Like, there's too many people motivated by greed, too many people motivated by power. In other words, the Romans aren't exactly <clears throat> saintly. They're conniving people. Yeah. All right, now we'll take Germania out of the box. Come here, Germania. All right, so this is what you got to remember. Tacitus is in a bind here. How do you write about Romans who are conniving, lying cheats, who do not exactly come across as virtuous, in fact, quite the opposite? How do you do that? Maybe the answer is 
you write about German people instead, and then you inflate how great the Germans are, glorify them, and then by that example, you make people want to be more German than Roman. Romans will then... Oh, we lost our way. Satire. See? It's that simple people. Next week we'll take a look at, not satire this time, but stoicism, I think. Yeah. Dr. K, we'll see you later.